Good morning, everybody. Good morning. How are y'all today? 
Good. So glad to see all of you today. My name is uh, Andy Bob Ward. I'm the Connections Pastor here. So so glad to see you guys. Lots of chatter this morning. I'm so glad you're here. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, a few announcements for you guys today. Uh, First off is Center of Hope. So Center of Hope is going to be doing their annual go and and feed all the people there. And it's going to be a great time of just uh, being able to serve and and do um, wonderful things. So they need help with some food. They need some help with some service and and people to, uh, you know, hand out food and to talk to families as they're there. Uh, Is Debbie Bach in here today? Debbie Bach? Is is she over there? Uh, So Debbie Bach, so that's her husband, Greg, right there. She will sit right there eventually. Uh, So uh, if you will go see her after the service today, um, she would just love, if you're willing to be a part of that to help out, uh, you can do that. Also, um, you know, if you need some help with that, there's some stuff on our website that allow you to sign up for different things. So uh, be sure you're doing that. Center of Hope, great. This Wednesday, June 1st. Also, uh, we have Adventure Week. So I'm wearing this Nifty Nido Adventure Week shirt. Uh, I'm going to be helping out doing some different things for Adventure Week. So if you're an adult, And if you'd love to help out with Adventure Week in any shape or form, it could just be, hey, I have an hour in between conference calls uh, Tuesday morning, and I can just be there just kind of help greet people, get people going where they need to go. Uh, We'd love to have you. If you just, man, want to just be the best servant for the Lord and just help with all the four-year-olds, we would love for you to be a part of that as well. So uh, you can uh, sign up for that. You can go to crossingalito.com and you can sign up to be a volunteer or you can see Sean uh, or Brandy to get plugged in with that. So it's gonna be a great time, great week. Uh, They're that last full week of uh, June. And man, uh, I think last year, Sean was talking about it just a minute ago. There was like 680 people on our campus for one day. So, and we hope to have about 150 to 200 helpers for that many kids and that many people. So, uh, we definitely need your help with that. So, be sure that you're signing up for that. And if you haven't already, you can sign your kids up for that as well. Man, I, I'll tell you, it's like the best week of their life here, uh, and, and it's, it's going to be awesome. Also, if you haven't signed up for our camps yet, our youth are going to Colorado. It's going to be great. It's going to be fun. Uh, and so, it's going to be nice and cool there in Colorado. Uh, I mean, it's right in between Colorado Springs and uh, Denver, so it's beautiful, Larkin, Colorado. Uh, So they're going to that, so if you haven't signed your kids up for that, you need to do that. And then uh, our students, our younger students, our kids are going to kids camp, and they will be um, doing that towards July, so be sure that you're signing up. I think they only have like three spots left for that. So again, we're so glad that you're here with us. If it's your first time today... There's a QR code in the back of the pew in front of you. If you don't mind just scanning that, uh, we'd love to just say, hey, uh, thanks for coming and just being a part of our church. Also, we have some very fantastic, wonderful people, Bill and Sharon Pate. They will be at the end of the service right here at this New Here kiosk. And if you haven't stopped by there already, they just have a a small gift they want to give you and just say thanks so much for coming. But again, excited about our service today. Let's stand up and greet one another. But before we do, everybody's hand has to be shaken by Lee's request. So be sure that if you haven't shaken your no one is shaking your hand yet, raise your hand and someone will come and shake your hand. Good to see you today. Good morning. It's good to see you all. We're going to sing praises to our Lord this morning. Let's sing this out. Oh, soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior and life more abundant. Through death, through 
death into life everlasting. He passed and we follow him there. Over us sin no more hath no meaning yet. More than conquerors we are. Come on, you know it. Sing it out. Turn your eyes. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory. shall not fail you. His word shall not fail you, he promised. Believe him and all will be well. Then go to a world that is dying, his perfect salvation to tell. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace, his glory. Sing that one more time. Turn your eyes. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory. The sunny in the rock. Sunny in the rock. Come on, praying for a miracle. Praying for a miracle. Thirsty for the living well. And only you can satisfy. Sweetness. Sweetness at the mercy seat. Now I've tasted. It's a hard to see Only you can satisfy Oh, there's honey in the rock 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 It's freedom Freedom Where the Spirit is Everything I need you got There's honey in the rock Purpose in your plan Power in the blood Healing in your hands Started flowing when you said It is done Everything you did is enough I keep looking I keep finding You keep giving Keep providing I have all that I need You are all that I need I keep praying, you keep moving. I keep praising, you keep proving. I have all that I need. You are all that I need. I keep looking, I keep finding, you keep 
Sunny in the rock, water in the stone. Men are on the ground, no matter where I go. I don't need to worry now that I know. Everything I need you got is honey in the rock, and purpose in his plan, power in the blood, and healing in your head. Started flowing when you said it is done. And Jesus, who you are, is enough. There's honey in the rock. There's honey in the rock. There's honey in the rock. And honey in the rock. Oh, how sweet, how sweet it is to trust in you, Jesus. Oh, how sweet, how sweet it is. Trust in you, Jesus, oh, how sweet, how sweet it is to trust in you, Jesus. He's forever faithful. Waiting for change to come. Knowing the battle's won. For you have never failed me yet. Your promise still stands. promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness, your faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never fail me
sing and believe. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Your faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never fail me yet. You never fail me yet. And I never will forget. You never fail me yet. And I never will forget. Sing that one more time. I've seen you move. No matter what you're walking through this morning. Our God is faithful, amen. And when we feel like we're in a dark place and we don't know what to do, we can always look back and say, God, you were faithful before. You're faithful now. You'll be faithful forever. So no matter what you're walking through, sing this with confidence. I've seen you move. Come on, every voice. I've seen you move. You move the mountains, and I believe I'll see you do it again. You made a way when there was no way, and I believe I'll see you. One more time. I've seen you move. I move the mountains, and I believe. I'll see you do it again. You made a way when there was no way. And I believe I'll see you do it again. That's right. You were the word of the beginning. One with God and the Lord most high. You sing your hidden glory, you sing. Your hidden glory in creation. And I'll reveal it in you. Keep on going, church. What a beautiful name.
What a powerful name it is. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a powerful name it is. And nothing can stand against. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. You have no right. You have no have no evil no. that's right oh. yours is the king yours is the glory yours is the name of all names what a powerful name it is what a powerful name it is What a powerful name it is. Nothing can stand against. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. your name there's no one like you God oh what can separate us from your love you have no rival you have no rival you have is the Lord, yours is the glory, yours is the name Just your voices. What a powerful name it is. in your name, God. There's power to break chains. There's power to free us from the things that ensnare us. There's power to deliver. There's power to heal. God, help us to believe that. Help us to know that it is for freedom that you have set us free, Christ. Freedom to worship you. Freedom to live out your will in our lives. Help us to focus on you and you alone as we hear from your word today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone, on this memorial today. First thing I want to do today is we've got a, a group going to Uganda leaving Thursday. The assignment this time is to work with our new construction team. And so Cole and Curtis are here today, and Amy is here. And Craig Nickel, would you come and pray for us, if you don't mind? Uh, the, the team will be leaving Thursday afternoon, and we'll be back at the Sunday the 12th. And so... Uh, uh, would y'all come so we can pray for you? Mine, Curtis. Keith Kubosh is also going, but Keith is not in church today. I don't know where he's at, but he's probably catching catfish somewhere. He probably watched that on TV, and I'll be in trouble. Are there catfish in Uganda? Are there catfish in Uganda? Yeah. I don't know. We're going to find out, aren't yeah, we? Curtis? Let's pray. Father, we're just uh, so grateful to be here. This Sunday on Memorial Day, we just uh, we just pray for Curtis and Cole and Amy and Keith and just the work that you're going to have them have them do. We just we know that you are going to bless a lot of people through this. We just pray for 
traveling mercies and we pray for safety and we pray for all of those things but most of all we pray for your kingdom work and just the awesome privilege and responsibility and, and gift it is that, that you let us participate in it and we just thank you that as a church we get to participate in this work we thank you just so much for the the people there we were praying for the people in Uganda that are going to be blessed by this we we just um, we just come to you this morning with thankful and grateful hearts and just we ask you to forgive us of our sins we pray all of these things in the great and awesome name of your son Jesus amen amen thank you Greg thank you guys y'all pray for each one of these this week each day if you would please also uh, Kyle and Amy are back from Cambodia good to see y'all yeah. Oh. And so when they're rested up, we'll let them do some talking to you. But I'll, there's probably still jet lag. Is that right, Kyle? Yeah. Where are you at? Over Alaska somewhere? Yeah. Glad you're here today. Uh, also, another uh, Israel has ended all their COVID restrictions. And so if you are, uh, that means, doesn't matter if you've had a shot, doesn't matter if you had any boosters or you hadn't had any, there is no test you got to have to get in there and no quarantine, no anything. So our trip is really on now. We've got about six couples signed up. So if you would like to go to Israel, uh, the day after Thanksgiving, we'll leave. And, and if, you, if you've been thinking about going, this is probably a good time for you to go because the next wave of trips, we're going to do the, the life of Paul and do his footsteps. We'll do that maybe 18 months away from the trip, so uh, we'll look at that and see how that works out when a good time for us to go, and we'll mainly go to Greece and Turkey and walk where Paul walked and see all the things he did. So, uh, But the best discipleship book there is is to go to the Holy Land. It is mind-blowing. We can take you to a few places that we know for sure Jesus stood here, just now, we can get close in many, nearly everywhere is around here somewhere, but there's several places where there's no question. It's the place. And so keep that in mind. If you're interested, please let us know, okay? Also, uh, this is Memorial Weekend. Tomorrow be Memorial Day. And, and Memorial Day is very difficult for my son, as you know, you easily understand that. And each Memorial Weekend, I, I didn't really intend it to be this way, but I've given you uh, a little brief uh, story of uh, one of the Marines that was with my son that lost her life. They lost a lot. He had two tours to Iraq. Uh, they did the Battle of Fallujah. And then uh, had lost lots of great kids. Just, it was horrendous. And then uh, went back the second time. And their assignment the second time was uh, Iraq was going to have their uh, vote. And it was a real, our government was really pushing that they would be able to vote without any, uh, you know, without any uh, fear. And they could get to the polls. And you, you probably remember there were many pictures of people with that purple ink or blue ink, whatever it was, on their finger after they voted. I guess they stuck their hand in a, we have a little sticker. They, have, they stuck their hand in a deal of ink that showed they had voted. And so uh, my sons, 2nd uh, Battalion, 1st Marines, were sent up to the Syrian border because there was lots of bad guys coming across uh, the Syrian border there, and they were, they, were keep, they were harassing the people and going to keep them from voting. That was one of the, at that time, uh, that was the, the challenge that was going on is they didn't want Iraq to vote, and so they were going to work at that and keep all the people going to work. So they had to go out there and, and root out the bad guys uh, Major Mendoza was the commanding officer of Echo Battalion. Uh, he was not my son's commanding officer, but my son did a lot of work with him as he was with the, what they call the heavy cat deal, and he had the tow missile and the uh, machine gun with him on top of the Humvee, and so they were with him a lot, and they protected him and helped him, and, and uh, he, Daniel told me that he was quite a warrior, uh, he grew up in New York City and uh, uh, went uh, to Ohio State University and won uh, the Big Ten in wrestling 
in this weight deal. He was, I've seen a picture of him. He was one solid dude, man. He was really something else. And uh, he was a weightlifter, of course, and he ran, and all those guys are crazy about exercise, of course. And uh, Daniel said he was fearless. Uh, he led into every house. He le- a major, the commanding officer, uh, he would be the first out, out of his Humvee if they were in Humvees and, and storm uh, a compound or a house or a territory or a, or a ditch or wherever the Marines were. And um, uh, they were looking for uh, some, some uh, terrorists in, up there in the Syrian border, and he stepped on a landmine. And he was killed instantly. He left behind a wife and two children. Today at Camp Horno in, in California, in Pendleton, Camp Horno is where the 1st Marine uh, Division Infantry Battalions are, 1st, 2nd, 3rd. And um, uh, Mendoza's guys, when they came home, uh, uh, raised a bunch of money and built a memorial on top of Mount Horno. And so tomorrow, uh, there will be Marines that will gather at Camp Horno uh, and they will go up and climb that mountain and, and pay homage to, in memory of, to Captain Major Mendoza. And so as you're thinking about Memorial Day tomorrow, please keep in mind Captain Major Mendoza and uh, his family. Something else I want you to consider, um, in, in that battalion uh, that had two really difficult tours in Iraq. Uh, they have lost to suicide several men. And not one, not very recently, was killed. Um, and PTSD is really a problem with these guys. I mean, they, they, what they saw in Fallujah might be compared to maybe the Battle of the Bulge with World War II. I mean, it was horrific. It was just unbelievable what they went through. And uh, many, many of the, of the young guys that get out uh, don't have the support, perhaps, or, or the PSD is so, so heavy on them that uh, they isolate themselves from society. Most of them do. Most of them go off and live in the woods somewhere, and uh, they're taking their lives. And it's a huge problem. And so if you would pray for uh, our Marine soldiers, airmen, that are experiencing great pain. And Memorial Day is not all hot dogs and beer for them. It, it just comes on them, the memories flood, and it's very, very difficult. So uh, I want to bring personal to you, because most of us don't have personal, uh, you know, attachments. And I just wanted to but I, I do know the Marines and the airmen in here and the soldiers that have served, they know. And Memorial Day is a time to consider and remember. And so please, please remember Major Mendoza, his wife and his kids. So the next scripture, the next scripture we have in Matthew chapter 7 begins in verse 15. And... Uh, Boy, it's really important that your pastor not be a false prophet. It's really important. Uh, Obviously, it is. It's really important that you have a confidence in your pastor, in your preacher, in the one that teaches God's word to you on a daily basis. And uh, with uh, we've all been reminded of the need for the church to be really healthy and really strong this week, haven't we? I don't think any psychiatrist or doctor or PhD person can really give an explanation to why that young man killed or shot his grandmother and then went to that elementary school and killed those kids and those two teachers. For the life of me, I can't figure that out. I mean, I've I've tried to think through that a little bit. I said, I I just can't think about that. Now, if... If uh, there was a serial killer at that school, I might go over there and try to get him, maybe. Maybe, probably not, but I might think about it. I might try to prevent other people being around him. You know, if, if someone is really, really bad, you know, okay, I, I can understand. But 
innocent children blows my mind. I, I, it, it, first of all, it shows us how horrible Satan is. Okay? Now, I don't know that young man's story. I don't know the situation. I understand that he was living with his grandmother and there was issues in his family and, and maybe there was some real difficulties there. But even then, to go into that school and shoot those kids. And, I, and, and I, you know, they've said he was bullied in school, all that's come out, but that's natural. We'll all say that. That may or may not be true. We'll see how things develop. Uh, but one thing I know for sure is that young man was extremely sick. And somewhere along the way, he either didn't have the ability to think well or it, his conscience was seared by sin at some point along the way. Because even unbelievers don't pick up a rifle and head to the elementary school. That's, that's unreasonable. That's sane, insane. That's beyond comprehension, isn't it? And so I was, I was just thinking, just like Jesus said when the tower fell, the tower asylum fell on the people, and when the people were at the, at the temple and they were killed by the soldiers, he said, was it their sin or, you know, that caused this? And he said, of course not. He said, but when you hear things like that, it's a reminder of you to repent, a reminder of you to think through things well. And so I think that that shooting, like every mass shooting is, and we're having way too many of them, obviously. It's a problem. We've got a real problem in our culture and it's an issue that's, that, I, don't, I mean, it can only be dealt with with changes of heart, changes of heart in families. Uh, the gospel must be presented for a change of heart to happen. So, so to me, it says how important we are to this community, how important you are to your school, how important you are to your company, to Lockheed, to, you know, all the other, Alcon and all the other companies, and whatever you do for a living, wherever you go, you know, if you sell insurance or you sell cantaloupes or you fix air conditioners or whatever you do, wherever you go, you are so important on your mission. And we never know when we're going to come across someone that is the next shooter. And we are the ones with hope. We are the ones with the truth. We are the ones that can, that can be used by God to help people's broken hearts and mend them. And we, we've, we, the only answer is do the best we can where we are and be used of the Lord to help these people. So look around your neighborhood. Look around your community. Look around your companies. Look around your classrooms. Look around your ball clubs. Look, you know, right now people are out playing softball. They hear this perhaps this next week. Look around your ball club. Who, who's disenfranchised? Where are those sitting outside the group? Which, which one of those are having the hardest time, you know, processing life today? It's an anxious-filled world, isn't it? I mean, there's lots of anxiety. Everything is up. I, I was just enjoying myself at, at a graduation party Saturday, and I was told that electricity is going to double. Thank you very much, Justin. I appreciate it. And he said, are you, are you locked in? And I said, it's looking, I don't know how long I signed up for it. And, and, and I've, it's, I had an email that I don't know when I received it. It said that I was about to lose my permanent number. And he said, oh, my gosh, you're going to pay out the, and, oh, i got to have that air conditioner running. We'll be in a bad shot, you know. And so uh, he's going to try to find me the best deal, this kind of thing. But, I mean, everything's going up. Everything's upside down. Everything's crazy, right? Lots of anxiety, lots of problems. We are needed. We've got to embrace that. And we've got to be who God's called us to be. And I, I, I am not at all, I don't know anybody in Uvalde. I don't know any churches there. I don't, I, I, I'm, you know, I, I believe with all my heart with how much God loves people is, People tried with that kid. Someone tried. God sent someone to his door. Something Along the way somewhere, the, people reached out to this kid if it, if it was this bad of a deal, right? All I know is what we're responsible to, and, and we got to share the good news and the love of Jesus everywhere, all the time. 
We have a huge mission in this, in this society we're living in, this culture we're living in. It's really depraved, and it's really hurting. So you need to have a true teacher. Your pastor cannot be false. But so let's get to the word today. All right. Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 through 20. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. So obviously, appearance isn't the issue. Appearance is not in. Some of you folks in here today of a little age, you remember Ralph Wolf and Sam Sheepdog cartoons? One of my favorite cartoons. They, they should have cartoons like that on these days. But they were always battling every day. The wolf against Sam the sheepdog. And they battle and battle and battle. And in several of those cartoons, Ralph Wolf takes a sheep and puts it on its back and walks up there. And, of course, Sam the sheepdog is always raising it back and socking Ralph Wolf in the face, you know, and then grabbing the sheep. And then the cool thing that I loved about this, these, these uh, cartoons was at the end of the day, they would put the, the Ralph Wolf and Sam Sheepdog would put their arm around each other and walk, clock out and walk out and say, good day. And he says, good day to be alive, Sam. Good day to be alive. I thought that was pretty cool. But we need to be bear with false, we need to be aware of false prophets because they are very difficult to see at times. They come to you in sheep's clothing. They come to you harmless. They come to you looking the part. They come to you in an appearance that everything is okay. They are safe, but they're not safe. And and the most effective false prophets are those that they're not great uh, chasms between truth and falsehood in their teaching, in their character, in what they do. And, and so you've got to carefully observe it. You've got, you got to go by the Word of God. You've got to take and see that what doctrines are they teaching falsely and what's going on. But Jesus says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. And so that's what you examine. That's what you observe. That's what you look for. What is their ministry? What is it producing? Is it producing people that love God more each day? Is it producing people that honor Christ? Is it producing people that live for Jesus and not for themselves? Is it producing people that are growing in faith and love and hope and gentleness? Is it, is it producing people that are making the most of God in their life and glorifying him, making much of him? Is that what the fruit is? It says in 17, so every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown in the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. So, Jesus told us in his ministry, beware of false prophets. Jesus said to us, they will come. Paul said to us, they will come. Peter said to us, they will come. And so to overlook this idea that there's going to be false prophets is a huge mistake because there's so much information about it. There's so much warning in the New Testament about false prophets will come. Jesus said, it's one of the signs of the end of days. It's one of the signs of the end of time that false teachers are going to appear. And, and they're going to be working overtime. They appear harmless, but they are not. And Jesus says, they are known by their fruit. Observe them. I'm going to go through some scriptures from Paul and Peter and, and look at some of the things that scripture teaches us that we need to look into. And I, I'm giving you permission today that at lunch you barbecue the preacher. Okay? And, and, and you need to talk about me a little bit, which I never say that, so that's a once in a rare time. And, and you need to ask yourself some of these questions, is he false or not? Because that's such an important thing to do. You've got to have confidence and trust. You've got to test what the man says and how he says it, what he believes, what he teaches, what he guides. 
is he is he on spot with what the what the Lord says based on those non-negotiables? Is he true or false? All right, here's some things to look for from the scriptures. Watch out when pastors are passionate concerning money, control, and power. 2 Corinthians 2, verses 14 and 17. But thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession, and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one, a fragrance from death to death. To the other, a fragrance from life to life. Who is sufficient for these things? And then Paul says, for we are not like so many. Paul says, we are not like this. And so that's important to Paul. Paul wants the readers, the church in Corinth, to understand that there is going to be false teachers, but he says, we are not like that, for we are not like so many. And he says, peddlers of God's word. Peddlers of God's word. But as men of sincerity, as commissioned by God, in the sight of God we speak in Christ. What you need to be looking for is, is your pastor pastoring, is he preaching to peddle God's word to make a financial profit from it, to receive back for himself more than than, than what should be there? What What is he really passionate about? What is he really after? Is he after your money, not your heart, right? Money's a side product devoted to Christ. And is he sincere or is he insincere? That's what you got to look out for. Today, we evaluate pastors by how they dress, which I dress purposely like this today, if you notice, all the way down. Just alarm some. I thought about it. I maybe put on my jeans again and my boots like I always do every Sunday because I'm most comfortable in that. But I went, nah, I'm going to cause a little stir today. Just go for it. Not beneath that. I did think about going to get my funeral suit on and really cause a stir. But of course, I always go the other way. Which It's not what they wear. It's not how they appear. It's not their style. It's not that they're polished. It's not that they can really wow a crowd. It's not that they can just reach out there and grab people's attention and hold their attention for 25, 30 minutes or however long the message is. But it's their calling and their character. Are they sincere? Or put it this way, does he really believe what he says? That's what you need to consider. And I mean, just as clear as day, does Lee really believe what he says? You need to answer that. You need to answer that. The preacher, the pastor, the prophet... He should not live in a $5 million house. He should not. I don't care how affluent the people are that he pastors. He should not live in a $5 million house. Now, I don't know what the number is. I don't know if that number is he shouldn't live in a $2 million house or a $3 million house. I don't know what that number is. But I know there's a number that the pastor should not live in because we're trying to be like Jesus. And, And there needs to be an understanding. It's okay for the pastor to have money. It's okay for him to live in a nice house. It's okay for him to drive a nice car. All that is okay. It's not okay that he live exorbitantly. And if the pastor lives exorbitantly, you need to watch out for that and be careful for that. I mean, if they've got to have three jets instead of one, ask yourself a question why. I would. If I was a member of church and the guy rode around, I said, dude, you make a lot of What's wrong with first class? Have you seen first class? When you fly, fly first class. You know, well, I've got to be free to go. No, 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 no. That's that's not, they may not be a false teacher if they're flying around in a jet airplane, but there's room to consider there, isn't there? There's some things to think about why they're doing that. They don't need to drive a $300,000 Ferrari. They might get to go on a ride in one. I'd like to ride in some of y'all's vehicles. Just ride. And if you're really generous, let me drive it one day, 
right? That'd be all right with me. I definitely don't think a preacher should wear a $5,000 suit. I mean, a $1,000 suit, I guess. I guess it's, you're a really fancy, a good dresser. I mean, I would ruin a $1,000 suit. It would look horrible on me. $2,000 tennis shoes for the life of me. I watched that Hillsong um, documentary that's on now about some of the things that they found out with the, these horrible things. And, and uh, this guy was interviewed on there, and he put, my daughter showed me this website or a TikToker or something, and and he puts pictures of preachers on this TikTok, and, and he shows them um, how expensive their tennis shoes are. I didn't know you could buy a pair of tennis shoes for $2,000. Why? I mean, for the life of me. Why? Justin Roper's best boots in the world, $100 now. Go get you some. Get you two pair. Be, exag- be exorbitant. You know, don't get it. All right, something else to consider. First Peter 5, 1 through 5, shameful game and domineering. Be careful when they try to control you. Influence is okay. Control is no good, okay? First Peter 5, so I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you. Exercise oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly. You got to want to, a lot of want to, all kinds of want to. But willingly as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not dominating over those in your charge, but being examples of the flock. There you go. Influence, okay. Control is not. Domineering over your people is not right. Lording over your people is not right. If you are in one of our Paul-Timothy relationships and discipling the D groups or different discipleship groups, if you're discipling someone, the disciple must never, the discipler must never lord over the one being discipled. We do not control people. They're the Lord's people. We're just part of the team. We're part of the family. We guide, we teach, we influence, we instruct, we rebuke, we exhort, as the Scripture says for us to do, but we do not control. So you need to take a look at that. Does that pastor that you're under, does he control people? And be real careful with that. Really analyze it. Observe it well. Objectively, is he about controlling or is it influence that he's after? Does he recognize that you are the Lord's, not his? Does he refer to it as his church or the Lord's church? Now, he may miss, mess up here. Does he, y'all come to my church, just like you would say, come, come to my church, Sunday, whatever. But, but does he really believe it's his church or is it Jesus' church? And he's just the under shepherd in that relationship. Yeah, when the pastor or the prophet benefits from shameful gain or having control over people, there's reason to be very suspicious and, and, and very cautious in that situation. Another thing that we need to be, consider is when pastors are people pleasers and overtly concerned with their image and a, just a, an obsession almost to be well-liked and popular. It's interesting in the church world today, man, we got lots of popular preachers, lots of popular pastors. I mean, you know, they, they do their podcasts, and they'll have thousands listen to them. You know, people drive a long way to go to certain churches because he's trendy, he's cool, he's hip, he speaks well, he's funny, he's good-looking, he does all these things. It just has this great attraction, right? Man, you need to really be careful if that pastor is living for that. And if they're a people pleaser and, and, and they just are more concerned with being liked and popular than teaching God's word. For the life of me, this is a crazy business plan that we have, isn't it? Teach God's word, then raise up an offering. <laughs> the craziest thing we ever do. We, it's like almost like going to a trainer. You go and that trainer kills you, and you give him $15 for the killing. 
What, what's, 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 so you're giving money that guy's putting you all that pain? Oh, yeah, it's wonderful. You know, you, we come to church, you hear God's word, and we pass the plate. You got to be saved. Just kind of understand that, don't you? Watch out when pastors are people pleasers. Listen to this. I charge, this is 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 5. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom. This is what is told to Timothy. Preach the word. Be ready in season, out of season. The Bible, the Bible, the Bible is really important. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience ooh, and teaching. You got to be ready with the word of God, he says to the preacher. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort. And then he says, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, listen to this, but have itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. Wow, there's coming a day when people will want to have their ears tickled and they will gather together teachers that suit their own desires. I love that pastor. Why do you love that pastor? Because the message he brings, it's the message that I understand the way I want God to be. Oh, my. Every Sunday we leave so encouraged he just makes us feel so good about ourselves. Oh, my. If we are in the Word, and if we were teaching the Bible, you can't leave church always feeling good about yourselves. Hopefully, at times, there's conviction. Hopefully, at times, there's godly sorrow that leads to repentance. Hopefully, sometimes, we are rebuked Hopefully, sometimes we're corrected by God's Word. We, none of us are perfect. If we are going in the Word and we are saying what it says, you can't feel good all the time. And, and do we not struggle with that in our world in Christianity today? It's happening right before our very eyes. It's taking place. People are accumulating for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. And you need to ask yourself, is, is that Pastor Lee? Is that what's going on? Is he, a, is he just a people pleaser? Is he more concerned with people's opinions of him than he is teaching God's word? That's a good debate. That's a good discussion to have at lunch today. Watch out for the pastor that develops a personality based ministry and, frankly, in the eyes of the people, is more popular than Jesus. I heard a man one day get sick at the church one day, and he realized that he had successfully built a church that had more people in it than he believed Jesus would have. Ooh. And he was struggling with it. Successful book writing, mega church, conference preacher. Began to really be stirred in his heart and go, oh, we've lost our way. And he repented. He said, I find myself loving the attention I get from the big crowd. And I'm probably thinking the wrong way. Jesus said something really interesting in Luke 6, 26. Woe to you. Woe. That's a, that's, he said, woe to the Pharisees, the brood of vipers, the snakes, he called them, the religious people. Woe to you. Oh, it's the warning of all warnings. It's, you better pay attention to this. You better understand this. I mean, woe is you when all people speak well of you. For so their fathers did to the false prophets. Oh, man. If your pastor, is he a people pleaser? Is he most concerned with people being pleased with what he says? There is concern that they may be false. Not absolute, but there's some concern. Reason to be observing. If, he, if, if the pastor builds a personality-based ministry, 
In other words, when they, when they die or they move on or whatever they do, change churches, the church goes away. It was all based on them. I, I will tell you with all my heart, I hope, I really believe that when the Lord moves me or I die or, you know, whatever happens to me one day, whatever, whatever day that is, don't, no issue here. I'm not, not trying to say anything. I don't know. This place is going to explode. Be so much better. I really believe that. I want that. I, I want to run into people after I'm done here and they walk into me and say, it's so good that you're gone. I mean, we, we struggled along with you all those years. We don't know what. But since you've been gone, that new guy, he's really good, man. That's what I want to hear. It's so much better. That's what I long to hear. And so be careful that they, they're basing the ministry all on themselves. And, and this may be the most crucial thing. A false teacher will explain away one or more of the non-negotiables. Now, it may not be a huge explaining away, but it's enough. Most real, most real shrewd false prophets, they're going to take something that's crucial to believe in, the blood atonement of Jesus, yeah, and, and, but they're going to lightly season it a little bit. You know, they're going to teach things like Jesus wasn't God when he came. He became God at his baptism. That's not true. The Bible clearly says that. That's not true. That's non-negotiable. Or they'll, they'll have an idea about the humanity of Jesus being larger than the deity of Jesus when he was here on the earth. Now he's fully divine because he's in heaven, but when he is here, he was more human than God. That's what they'll teach. They, they'll teach certain things about miracles, these miracles are because of this. These miracles are because of this particular understanding of things. They, they, will, they will say to you more than a normal approach, this is what the Lord told me. I know the Bible says this, but I was praying, and in prayer I had a heavenly vision, and, and I think this is what the Lord said. You see, Joseph Smith is a false prophet, Okay? There, there's no archaeological, ar archaeological evidence of the people that he said were here. There weren't any white people here. Even DNA has shown that with all the DNA developments these days. The, the, there was probably no golden tablets, right? I mean, if he was, he made them. I mean, and so if archaeology doesn't speak it, if history doesn't speak it, if there's no evidence, then... then you got to really be careful about the man saying and what the man said and what he believed. I mean, the Bible, the Old Testament, New Testament, the places are there. Hebron is there. Bethlehem is there. Jerusalem is there, right? All these things are taking place, right? They're there. You know it. The history supports it. And so... Uh, You've got to understand, look into all the pieces of information to help you determine whether or not they're true or false. But a false teacher will explain away one or more of the non-debatables. They don't have to be way wrong. They can just be a little wrong. And that's what you've got to be careful of. If anyone, 1 Timothy chapter 6. If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the teaching that accords with God is he is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words, which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, and constant friction among the people who are depraved in mind and depraved, deprived of the truth. Imagining that godliness is means of gain. Wow. So look at these things. This is the fruit that a false prophet produces. Unhealthy craving for controversy. Westboro Baptist Church in, K in Kansas. Horrible. 
Terrible. Terrible, terrible, terrible. God hates fags is their website. That's false. Unhealthy craving for controversy. Quarrels about words. The higher criticism movement in theological circles. You know, well, it depends on what your definition of is is. That happens in theological terms too. Quarrels about words. Jesus walked on the water. Peter said, Lord, if it's that you, I'll come on out there. Come. Jesus didn't walk on the water. Quarrel about words. Jesus walked around the water. Aha! Peter's something else saying he walked right out there and walked a little bit. Oh, well, let's talk about words. And when you are enlightened, and when you understand like I do, you'll understand. Quarrels about words. And this produces quarreling about words, unhealthy craving for controversy, produces envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth, and imagine that godliness is a means of gain. So what is the pastor leaving behind? Loving Jesus, loving God with all their heart, soul, strength, mind, learning to love neighbors, growing in faith, love, mercy, gentleness, those things, bearing fruit, or is it envy, dissension, slander, evil, always dividing people against each other? You got to check out what they say by Scripture. You got to check out what they say through prayer, being led by the Holy Spirit to guide you and know what you're going with. And let me remind you, not appearance, not style, but character and content. We are today absolutely conditioned that it's appearance and style in every walk of life. But when it comes to observing and looking at the fruit, it is content and it is character. So the main question you need to ask yourself today is, God using Pastor Lee, Lee Brewer, to produce fruit? That's what you got to ask here. When you think about other people that may or may not be false prophets, that's the real key. So a few lessons in plain language. The true pastor, the sincere pastor, he will desire to please God far more than pleasing you. He will honor God's word more than books written about God. He would desire Jesus to be seen beyond him. He's going to be okay playing second fiddle. He will be okay with disagreement, but he will not be okay with being disagreeable. There's two different things there. He will love God with all his heart, and he'll love others as himself. He will live by testimony, the blood of Jesus, and not afraid to die. Not if, those are, in Revelation 3, those are the weapons that defeat Satan. And a, a true prophet, a true man of the Lord, is going to live by those three things. And they will preach without applause. They will preach without applause. Have you ever had a pastor tell you that they'd preach for nothing? I'd preach for nothing. I'm going to tell you right now, I would preach for nothing. I may not put up with a lot of things during the week for nothing. <laughs> I guarantee you there's a lot of things I ain't going to put up with during the week for. But I'll preach for nothing. Personally, if, if you got a pastor that won't preach for nothing one day, you need to think about that a little bit. Now, would he rather be paid? Yes. Would I rather be paid? Well, of course. Sure, obviously. But the calling 
is more important than the gain. The calling is more important than the gain. Stephen Curtis Chapman sang a song, For the Sake of the Call. They were so abandoned. No applause for the sake of the call. I think that's what Jesus is referring to, to the things he needs to look at. He says, beware of false prophets. And we live in a time that we need to beware of false prophets. Let's pray. Lord, may your will be done. May your spirit work in us today. Unusual message, Lord, perhaps. But Lord, we recognize what your word says. Help us to see what we need to see. May your spirit guide us, show us, teach us. May we repent if that's required today. May we admit some mistakes, admit our sins before you, Lord. We pray, Lord, as we have our last song, it'll be a time of invitation in our hearts. And Lord, as we take up our offering, may it be pleasing to you. And we just love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Ushers, come forth. Savior say thy strength indeed is small child of weakness watch and pray find in me thine all in all Cause Jesus made it all all to him I owe sin had left crimson stain Still white as snow. Lord, now indeed I find thy power and thy alone can change the leper spot. paid it all all to him I owe sin had left a crimson stain he washed it white as snow white as snow washed away and when before the
Jesus paid it all. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Amen, amen. You are dismissed. Have a great week.